Welcome everybody to the Mullins Over Music Podcast. I'm going ahead and getting the intro out of the way. Um, this week's guest is Nate Blasdale. Um, due to Zoom, but thankfully to me, double recording. I have the podcast in its entirety, minus the first five minutes where I ask him two silly questions. And then uh, the question is uh, that he starts talking from is take me back to young Nate and he walks me through his uh, journey to becoming a musician. So enjoy. Uh, I'm not sure where it starts off at, but yeah. Nate Blasdell, formerly of I Set My Friends on Fire and Loser's Club. Uh, enjoy, and we'll see you soon. And I was so like out of touch with like that culture and whatnot, but I wound up going down and doing it. Um, I didn't, they were very open with me that I didn't get the gig because of my guitar playing. I got the gig because of what I wore. Uh, they liked my image, I guess, at that time, believe it or not. There was a time when I was young and skinny and fashionable. That, <laughs> that's not the case anymore, but. Um, You're still but, fashionable. Uh, Come on. I like well, that I Whitney think... Houston uh, shirt. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Rep, it, rep, rep Whitney. But, uh, you know, from there, like, uh, it was, I just got in at the right time with the bunny and, you know, stuff kind of started taking off from there. And then, um, you know, through some connections and whatnot, I got in touch with Matt from I Set My Friends on Fire. And, um, you know, I had the van in the trailer uh left over from the first band that i was in um so that definitely helped kind of get my foot in the door of some of these guys and um you know it just wound up coming down to a point where isn't started talking about getting back together in like january of 2014 um and i don't think we wound up doing anything until the summer of 2015 so like it was a year-long process to to make sure everything you know fell into place but you know like i said Thousand things have to go wrong to uh, to to connect the dots. Sorry, sorry that was uh, sorry that was a super long story. No, that was you hit every question. Like I have several of them, and you hit a good bit of them on the dot. So I appreciate <laughs> For sure. it. For sure. But yeah, that that was a great story, man. I definitely, definitely. keep up with that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it was definitely definitely a wild adventure. Um, you know, it's crazy to see how some of the people who, you know, we met along the way or or I used to play with, like where they are now. Like the singer of the first band that I was in, uh, that I talked about was went off to go and play in a band called the Rex, um, that's doing like super, super well. Um, you know, the first round of the Bunny the Bear when I joined, it was Danny Case, who's now the lead singer from Ashes and New, uh, Rob Weston, who's now the basis of the Funeral Portrait, uh, Tommy Vinton, who's now the vocalist of Jinx, and um, yeah, like you know, like they all went off and did awesome things, and it's it's crazy to see, you know, crazy to see the same people that like you grew up with and started from the bottom with, you know, really doing well. So it's it's awesome for sure. I, I think I sent Danny a, a message. He he needs to respond back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually saw Danny not too long ago. Um, I saw Danny like the other week. He was in Buffalo um, the 15th, the day that Dropout came out. So um, Jimmy, who played guitar in Ism Foff, um, who also played on a bunch of like, they're staying on a bunch of the Losers Club stuff. Yeah. He plays guitar for From Ashes to New Now. So um went out connected with him and danny and and saw all those guys so um you know it's cool to see how well they're doing for sure oh yeah i mean and their their tiktoks are blowing up pretty well too yeah they're they're a really good band man like he's always been a super talented guy and you know they definitely put the work in so shout out to them for sure yeah big shout out shout out to you for your staying fashionable by the way (laughs) i appreciate it man thank you (laughs) Okay, so besides guitar, are there any other instruments that you play? Yeah, I mean, I like, I'm, I wish I I kept up with it more. Um, 
like I can still play, but there was a time that I was probably a better pianist than I was uh, um, than I was guitar player. Uh, so definitely play the piano. I really love like obviously kind of comes with the territory, but I really love like writing bass lines. Um, I don't know why. Like it's just something like that that <laughs> it's really stuck out with me. Um, so you know, bass, uh, piano. Uh, I was played violin for like 16 years growing up and you know kind of I shouldn't say 16 years and more like 14 but I kind of like got bullied out of it or kind of let like the label uh like the label of like being a violinist like you know get to me and and like oh that's not cool and quit playing violin but I wish I had stuck with it because um you know like it's really good to be versatile and there's definitely stuff to bring to the table like I picked up a violin a couple weeks ago and I can still play a little bit, but not nearly like I could when I was younger. And, you know, I wish I wish I had stayed with it because, um, you know, like I said, it would just add a lot to songwriting and whatnot. So um, I, I wish I did, but, <laughs> you know, can't change the past. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Um, my buddy went from viola to guitar and he hasn't picked it up in a while either. But you're you're right about it bringing a certain level of songwriting. I mean, there are bands that are now capitalizing on the whole metal with violin. Yeah. Uh, thing. I think I see them on yeah. TikTok all the time. Yeah, there there definitely is, and and like you said, it, it it's it's cool. Like, I mean, I wish I wish that uh you know I wish that the scene was a little bit like more open to like the the variety of things that they're open to now back then you know like it back in the day it was very much like hey you have to have these assets in your band or be this person and that's what fits and you know like i feel like a lot of people try to fit within that box including myself and you know i wish that wish that it was more open it seems like it's more open these days but um you know is what it is people i think people are more receptive to you know everything now as opposed to the MySpace era and yeah, one hundred percent before that, and a little bit after that, one hundred percent. But you know, better late than never. Am I right? Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Okay, so let's talk about writing because I love writing. I love to hear the writing process. What what was uh, the writing process like for your new record, uh, Dropout? It was really like sporadic and and different than a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past. Like, um, you know, with uh, like back in the day, I just pick up like an acoustic guitar, come up with an idea, whatever, um, you know, jam it out until something sounded good. And now it's like, you know, as I got more in touch with like the production side and like, you know, recording and producing, which like, like there's certain things that I've gotten good with. There's a lot of things that I haven't gotten good with in that regard, but you know, this was like the first time that like everything was really like written from square one on a grid um, or like, you know, like written as it was recorded kind of um, demoed out. So like you could, you know, once an instrumental was finished, you could go back and do, um, you know, fit, find the best vocals that fit. And then, uh, the best vocal melodies and whatnot, or, you know, record some vocal melodies and then go back and write the lyrics for them. Um, you know, like, like I said, it's kind of across the board. Um, but, um, you know, I wrote most of it with Andy, who's also in Losers Club. Um, he and I just hit off really well on a certain level. Um, you know, he, someone who I know, like, someone who I know could be like fully honest on everything on how they felt and not get offended uh, by anything. And, you know, I think that that's really important when it comes to writing, um, you know, like I think that something that I realized from like the first serious band that I was in, um, you know, I probably wrote 80% of the music at that time. Um, and so I'd always kind of thought in my head, like, oh, I can go off and do this on my own. Like, 
I don't need Weston or whatnot. And the 20% that Weston brought to the table in that band was like everything. Like, like the, the, like, Hey, try this vocal melody instead of that vocal melody or like try this lyric instead of that. Or what if you threw like a, a flanger on the guitar here, or, you know, what if you use dotted eighth note delay here or there? And like, that's where like a lot of like the, like monumental ideas come from. And, you know, that's something that, I had with Weston that in this weird way, I don't want to don't want to sound too dramatic on it, but you know, that's something that I was kind of like chasing with somebody else, like trying to find somebody that I connected with on that level with the writing from the writing side for a couple of years. And when I found Andy, um, we were kind of both in like the same place in our lives. And like, we became super close friends outside of, you know, the band, which I think that's, helped a lot in like the writing chemistry and whatnot because that's the other thing like Weston and I were best friends at the time um with the first band so you know we kind of both Andy and I kind of both like got that that you know that that chemistry back that you know both of us were kind of chasing so um you know like I said it was it was a really cool process um there's a couple songs that some other people were involved with our friend Dustin um, is a phenomenal, phenomenal vocalist. Um, but, you know, when there is something that we thought we had a good idea on, but it just wasn't clicking with our vocals or wasn't click, like we knew that it needed to be taken to the next level. We would just send it off to Dustin and Dustin would record it and send it back to us. And, um, you know, he would change some vocal melodies and, and change how some stuff was done. But, um, you know, like he did fool's gold, um, and Fool's Gold was originally like um it was originally like twenty BPMs faster than the the recording was and he slowed it down and he slowed it down and dropped the pitch on it and we were like, damn, like this is it. Like like you know, which the vocal melodies are pretty much all the same, lyrics are still exactly the same, you know, chord progressions and stuff pretty much exactly the same, but um you know, having those extra people that, that throw some ideas in and, and, you know, that, that completely changed the song, but it made it what it is. So, um, you know, like I said, uh, there's some other people that we, that we worked with, like Rob Freeman from Hidden in Plain View helped us with some stuff. There's a producer from Germany. His name's Julian. Um, really, really good, um, producer. And, you know, I feel like there was, I feel like anything we were influenced by um, or anything we wanted to do, we had somebody that we could go to for it. You know, like Andy and I got super into this artist, Lauv, um, L-A-U-V. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, we got super, super into his stuff. And, um, you know, we had never really made like that type of music before or like that type of pop or whatnot. And like, you know, we went to, we went to, Julian with some ideas and whatnot and we're like hey you're the guy to fucking bring this to life and like he just absolutely crushed it and you know made it exactly what we were aiming for and going for so um Nick Thompson from Hit the Lights uh wrote uh he didn't write any of the songs directly but he wrote some of the lyrics and some of the vocal patterns on on a song or two um but yeah it, you know it's it's definitely it was definitely cool. Like there was no boundaries. There was, there was nothing that we really like threw out per se, or like, Hey, that wasn't us. Like it's so multi-genre across the board that, you know, this was like the first record that we really ever got the chance to do like 100% on our own without like a Hawk looking over our shoulder of like, whether that be a label or be a manager or whatnot. So, um, you know, like, we really kind of did whatever the fuck we wanted whenever the fuck we wanted and it wound up working out, you know? So. Yeah. Well, you definitely got quite a few people on the record besides you guys. Um, I was just looking through here. You got Jimmy Bennett. You got Dustin, yeah. like you said. Uh, you got Tim the Truth. <laughs> Tim the Truth, my man. And then you got uh, Lauren Babbitt. Yeah, so the Lauren Babbick story is super funny. So w that song was recorded back in 2019. Um, so she was she was doing well at the time, but like how, yeah. like she's doing super super well now. Like, um, but um, she was doing okay at the time on YouTube and whatnot. But um, that song was supposed to be in a in a video game called NASCAR Heat Five, 
and um we essentially got hit up on like a 48 hour notice that was like listen we have the option to like we had an artist that we didn't get the licensing from on the song we had a connection this was before i worked in nascar but we had a connection through a driver that was friends with one of the people that was working at the at the company that that produced the game so like look if you can turn us around a song in 48 hours you know as long as it fits within the guidelines like we can we can get it on the game and we're like awesome let's do it and like you know we were self recording pretty much everything at that time and i forgot i forgot exactly what happened but there was a reason why we weren't able to self record it um i think there's something going on with my computer so like we found this random guy in the middle of nowhere, like an hour from us um, on Facebook. That's like, Hey, you guys can come in and record this tonight. And like, we were writing it on the spot, whatnot. But anyway, because things had, things had been so like, like there was no song that was built around for it. It was a song that we had to go out and essentially record for it and write specifically for the game. And, um, you know, we wound up, getting into the chorus and the chorus we had written um we had written sitting there and whatnot but when it came down to track the chorus it was just in it was in a key that it was just out of my range for the most part um just being completely honest with you um and it was kind of too late to like pitch shift everything down or, or whatnot or drop the key or re-record whatnot so you know, we were going through my phone saying like, hey, who is there that can record the chorus vocals on this? And, you know, Nate will do the lowers, whoever else does the hires, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I came across Lauren. Um, we had just, Ism Floff had just toured with her band at the time, uh, Red Handed Denial in Canada. And like, we had remained super close friends. Um, so I hit her up and I was like, Hey, is there any chance that you can do this on like, uh, like, can you get this back to me? Like by 7am in the morning. And she's like, that's crazy. But yeah, actually I can. She's, a, she was working as a teacher at the time. So she was like, that's one of the things that we had connected about. Cause at the time before I worked in NASCAR, I was also a teacher. So, um, you know, I think that she had a snow day or something. I don't know exactly what it was, but it just so happened that she had time to record it that night and she finished it at like five in the morning and the song was due at like 10 AM. And, uh, I remember like she was super tired and this is none of her fault at all. Like this is actually like 100% on my end, but, um, she sent me over the stems and was like, Hey, I'm going to bed. And I didn't request that the stems come over dry, like essentially like, uncompressed untuned everything uh they came over like fully wet with like you know the delay everything else on them and when you're recording vocals in two separate places you always want the dry tracks because it's really 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 hard to make them line up or sound like they flow together so i was trying to get a hold of her but she'd gone to bed and the song was due at like <laughs> like i said the song was due in like four hours so um we couldn't get the vocals like it wasn't the matter of like like the harmonies actually sounded really good together but the the like quality of them just didn't sound right it didn't fit because um like i said like they were wet we couldn't match the vocal chain that she had mat that she had done and whatnot so um we wound up taking my vocals out of the chorus my song my court my vocals are in the rest of the song besides the chorus um which like most bands don't do that when you do a feature it's normally like a verse or something like um but it sounded super awkward like if you listen to it you can sound, you can tell that there's a difference between like like how they're edited and how they're produced or whatnot but anyway we wound up doing it um wound up finishing the song and sent it over and there was a little bit of um on the first version that we had give them there was like a little bit of of pushback because we had a line that was find a cliff and hit the gas um and they like they're like this game's rated e like you know this we can't we can't have this so what? <laughs> we, we took it off we took it we took it out and they're like all right we're good we'll get you a contract in the next week and a half or whatnot and 
they hit us back and essentially were like, look, like the original version didn't make it. So we're going to put it on the next NASCAR heat. It's going to come out the following year. Like we'll send you a contract for it, everything. Um, what they wound up doing is the band of void wound up getting two songs on that opposed to just one. So they have two songs on the soundtrack. And I think that the second song essentially replaced ours. Um, but um, yeah, it was definitely a, a, a weird scenario. And like four months later, we had found out the company claimed for bankruptcy. So uh, I filed for bankruptcy. So it's kind of a crazy story of that, but you know, it kind of sat on my computer. We weren't going to put it out. Um, but we had announced that the song, we announced the album was going to be 24 songs. And um, one of the other songs that we were going to do wound up not getting a clearance because of the feature that was on that. So um, we wound up, we weren't going to put out 23 songs and we said we put out 24. So we put out the one with Lauren, not thinking about like how big Lauren has gotten like on Spotify, on YouTube and whatnot. And ironically, I feel like that's one of the worst songs uh, structurally and because it was rushed. The, the recording sounds terrible, like everything. But ironically, that's been like one of them. I think that's the number one spot song on Spotify right now. But I think it's mainly because of like her following and and, uh, and whatnot, picking up on it. So it's kind of funny how that worked out. You're definitely right. It is the top song on uh, Spotify. Which is hilarious because like I said, like structure wise, like, like once again, nothing on Lauren, but like the fact that we were so rushed on our side, like I don't feel like the song is very good, but um, like I said, it wasn't even supposed to be on the album, but it's funny how, how it all worked out for sure. I think if I remember correctly for that video game, it did commercially pretty bad. So that was like it for the company when they, yeah. The, the, so the, they released like the same game pretty much like NASCAR heat three, four and five were pretty much the same exact thing. So um you know it just wasn't like working from the other side of it like so they wound up giving or th so they wound up selling out of bankruptcy i believe to uh, another company called motorsports games it was 704 games was the company that was running nascar heat then they sold yeah. to motorsports games which like motorsports games was supposed to be like a big deal um but I think that their situation was, I think that they had announced that the new NASCAR game, NASCAR Ignition, I think they'd already announced that it was going to come out um, before they knew the progress that was actually made on it. And like NASCAR Ignition is like known as like historically like the worst, most glitchy game of all time. Like it was released and was... Um, it was released and was not ready to be released at all. Like, um, you know, like you couldn't finish races, you couldn't finish pretty much anything on the game. So, um, not surprising that it went down the way it did, but, uh, you know, and it made, makes a good story. Everybody asks about why the songs titled that. So, uh, you know, it, it is a true story for, uh, for those who want to check out the song, it's the song was supposed to be on a video game, but the company went bankrupt. It also sucks. Demo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which so. sounds very pop punky. Yeah. I I love the I love the uh the nomenclature for the song. So one hundred percent. And you you being a a big you know influence by pop punk when you were a kid, it totally makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, thank you for sharing that story. I, that was a great story, actually. I'd... <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Okay, so my next question is, what is your favorite song you've written and your least favorite song you've written? Besides that one. <laughs> oh, man. Least favorite song that I wrote. Um, trying to think. Um it, it is a tough question. I always got to, you know, there, there's definitely, mind. there's definitely songs though. Um, um, I'm trying to think across the board. So there is a song, dude, I don't know why I can't even think of what the song is called. Um, it's an ism Fof song. It was one of the last ones that we released. It was the last full band one that we released. Um, 
2018 or 2019. Why the fuck can I think of what it? Oh, Versace Tamagotchi. Yeah. So we hadn't finished that song before. So we were we recorded it at a studio at the end of like a like three month tour, and we were all exhausted. We were beat, but this kid was willing to do us a favor. I think he recorded it for free, and he was an incredible producer. Um, but we really didn't like the idea in this, like the idea of the song is there 100%, but we left it pretty open-ended. Like our idea was we were going to come back and finish it, but uh, I think life just got in the way and the producer wound up finishing it on his own. Um, and like I said, Matt has a real lot of really good vocal melodies in it and like had potential to be a fucking great song. But the producer finished it on his own, which shout out him, great dude, and like right intentions for sure. But like there I feel like most people wouldn't realize it, but I think that mo- like, you know, from our side, like Ism Fof side, like we recognize that, you know, there's things that like it 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 was not its final form. And I think that we all hate the fact that it wasn't its final form because like, like I said, like I think that some of the best vocal melodies that Matt ever wrote were on that song. And uh, I think that the idea was there for sure. But like, you know, it just, it sucks to see that. Like, I would love the chance to go and re-record that, even though I'm not with his and Fof anymore, I would love the chance to, you know, we're still super close friends and whatnot. Like I would love the chance to go and like properly finish that song. Um, but like you can hear like the guitar and the chorus like if you listen for it like one of the rhythms doesn't match up with the other and like you know there there's some weird things in the, in 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 the chorus that like all from like the band side that you know it, it just wasn't finished right so um that one probably bothers me because i feel like don't take me for pomegranate was one of like the best songs that we wrote um Uzi was pretty good too. Um, but uh, you know, like I said, that that's a little bit of a of a tough scenario because yeah. like I said, Matt and I, I think Matt's vocals on that song are great, but it just was uh, you know, wasn't really us that got the chance to finish it. So um favorite song that I've ever written. Um Probably it's it's off of you know I was talking to somebody about this yesterday it's off of Dropout but um, Forever and Always um, it was a song that I it's one of the songs is doing super well I think it's number two on Spotify right now it's definitely got like the most attention from like people that I know but um, you know that's a song that like I wrote about my parents um, and uh, you know I feel like I always had wanted to write a song about my parents or for my parents per se. Like I actually wrote it for them for Christmas last year um, as, as a Christmas present. Like finally, Hey, I made time to do it. Um, but uh, you know, that, that song kind of went on a ride. Um, we wound up, so I wound up actually getting an offer from a country artist on it, like a decent sized country artist. Um, and we had everything worked out and ready to go on it. Um, and they at like literally like a week before everything was finalized, they wound up getting dropped by their label. Um, so I got the song back, which was like, turned out to be a blessing, but, um, you know, it's cool to see how well it's doing. It's cool to see that it held up and, you know, having one of the most popular songs be like the most meaningful or like have like the most meaning behind it. Like that's, it's pretty cool to see. Um, you know, that's something that like, obviously I wasn't involved in writing the first, I set my friends on fire record, but you know, that's something that I think was always really cool for Matt was, you know, things that rhyme with orange was like one of the most meaningful songs to him under the fact that like it had like a very, relatable meaning and there's people that like you know it, people that could relate with it and whatnot and um you know to, to kind of be, be able to experience it on like a much smaller level but to be able to experience that with forever and always like that's super cool that um 
you know, seeing people pick up on it and knowing that like, okay, the song is not about like a girl that doesn't exist or like a scenario that never happened. Like the song is about, you know, my family and my parents growing up and, and uh, you know, like that's definitely, uh, definitely super cool for sure. That's so, that's so cool. I I dig it. And yeah, you were right. It is number two. So you got simultaneously the funniest song and the most meaningful song in your top two. So how it goes, man. You got to walk the line between seriousness and humor, right? I swear. It's always the song that like is the throwaway song or it's like the song that's just doesn't make sense or whatever. That's always the number one one. Well, Matt, Matt always said that about things that rhyme with orange. Like Matt hated things that rhyme with orange when he recorded it. Like, you know, and it wound up becoming like he, he appreciated like the lyric side and whatnot, because like, obviously like he wrote it somewhat about himself. Um, but, um, or like, you know, what he went through in high school and whatnot. But, um, you know, he said that like, he always said that, he didn't know that, that was going to be the song that like popped off and that, you know, became like the staple of the band, but it's funny how it works. Right. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, and I think about this with everybody, if the, if the number one song that you wrote had not been written, what do you think would be the, the top song? Yeah. I mean, it's always interesting to see that like perspective of it because there's songs that I feel like there's songs that I feel like would be bigger um, if they had the right push behind it. Like I think about like for Ism Foff, I think about like, don't take me for pomegranate. Like Lotus was popping off at that time um, that we dropped that. And like, I remember like Matt and I wrote a lot of that song together and um I remember we were both kind of like, you know, this is exactly the vein of like what we want to do at that time. Like we want to do a full band thing, but incorporate beats and whatnot. And, um, but like we were absolutely broke at the time. We didn't have a label. We didn't put any marketing into it or anything. And um, I feel like that song could have been way bigger. I feel like if we had dropped it during like the time that like all the, when we were young fest stuff was going on, it, it could have taken off and there's, other songs in Matt's release that I feel like the same way about that. Like, I feel like there's some really good stuff and some of the stuff that Matt's written um, that just didn't get the proper eyes because of whether it was the time that was released or, you know, not having the marketing budget for it or not having the support on it that it needs. Like there's definitely a lot of stuff in, in, in that ism Foff discography that, you know, I feel like could have done better if, uh, if it was different circumstances for sure. I'm a, I'm a big deep cuts fan of uh, every band for that matter. Um, so I always think, man, this song is so good. If only it was like heard by more people. And you know, for people who are like fans of I Set My Friends on Fire or, you know, fans of, you know, even Spirit Box or, you know, your stuff with Losers Club or any of these big bands, small bands you know they sometimes they just don't go to those really big deep cuts and you're like man if you'd just listen to that you'd see that this is like the best representation that i could possibly give you of what this project or what this band is about yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. excuse me that's all that all that holiday stuff getting to me 100 <laughs> percent. i feel you Okay, so what is your favorite song to play live off of your loot? Have you played uh, any of your Losers Club stuff live yet? Yeah, we had a couple shows this summer. Um, we haven't played a ton, but we had a couple shows this summer. Um, probably, uh, probably how it feels to be a ghost would probably be my favorite. Um, but yeah, do you play the uh, the demo song live? <laughs> We don't. We don't. And I have no idea what we're going to do for it because we don't have the backtracks or anything for it. So I'm hoping that it dies out here a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you take the numbers how you can get them, right? Of course. Of course. Okay. So since we're talking about songs in general, songs that you like, what you got any guilty pleasure songs 
It's probably I listen to a lot of country, to be honest with you. Like I listen to a lot of country. Um that's probably what I've been listening to the most. I went through a rap phase for a little bit. Um but uh I I also love like early like two thousands pop, like Michelle Branch, like Ashley Simpson, like they got some fire shit in there, but um Mitch Tenpenny definitely been like one of my favorite artists uh right now. Um Dan and Shay, like definitely one of my favorite favorite bands of all time. Um I really like the band Point North. They're like more so yeah. like in, in in like the the Losers Club era, like genre, but really like Point North. Um Yeah, I mean, I don't listen to a ton of metal. Um like there's some stuff that I, I've caught up on recently, but um, I'm not like, like I respect a lot of the stuff that's going on in metal, but like, it's just not for me. Like, I think that like the sleep token thing is cool, but like, I personally don't really <laughs> not a huge fan of it. Um, like not being a hater by any yeah, means. Like, course. like I said, I respect it. I think it's really cool what they've done, but like to me, like the songs just sound like, breaking benjamin with a ton of reverb on him <laughs> like um you that's, know that's accurate uh, <laughs> like like um i not like a huge spirit box guy but i think once again i think what they've done is, is fucking awesome um you know like i said i have a lot of respect for the moves that they made i've just haven't you know just not really my my thing i feel like i've kind of grown out of it a little bit but yeah um you know, I really like, uh, I guess as far as heavy stuff goes, um, like I, I do like Slaughter to Prevail. I think the Slaughter yeah. to Prevail is very good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest, like 90% of what I listen to is country these days. So, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I guess the fun fact, I guess. That is, that is a fun fact. See, you had a fun fact all along. Should have, I should have had that be the fun fact, right? Yeah. But um, okay. I I dig your opinion, man. It it's you're right. It and I've never heard Sleep Token described like that. <laughs> that is like, what? like I said, dude. It, it's 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 un un, un uh, undeniable what they've done, though. Like you know, to to blow up as fast as they have. You know, that's pretty cool. But yeah, he said they're breaking Benjamin with a lot of reverb. <laughs> but you know like i said they, they're they're cool like i i think that like especially like the lyrical aspect and and whatnot you know that's awesome um like what they're what they're doing like with the storytelling and everything like that's uh it's a pretty cool scenario yeah hold on your keys yeah. right here thank you I'm edit that part out. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I dig it. You listen to a lot of country. Oh, that makes sense uh, considering the moves you made. So <laughs> I guess, yeah. Especially with NASCAR. Yeah, you know, I feel like it kind of comes hand in hand. But honestly, like, I was a pretty big country guy before I got in NASCAR, to be honest with you. Like, honestly, like, most of the people I've been around, like Matt was Matt from I set wasn't like a huge country guy, but like Chris, the drummer, Jimmy, um, Hector, like the majority of them have been, have been, <laughs> you know, like it's funny to see how it's kind of evolved and, and see how, you know, like even bands that we toured with would be like, yo, have you checked out the new Dan and Shay record or whatnot? You know, it's kind of crazy how all that works. But. Yeah, man. Well, I dig it. Uh, you know, I think with metal nowadays, it's tr the current trend is, like you said, a lot of reverb or deathcore. <laughs> yeah, uh, which I like deathcore. Like, uh, I like some, some deathcore bands. Like, I was into, like, when I was into like the heavy stuff, I was into like pretty significantly like heavy stuff. Like I was never really into like asking Alexandria or like attack attack or anything like that. Like I was into like Carnifex and like, um, gift giver and, and 
stuff like that. But, you know, it, it I always respected like what the what bands were doing. Like, you know, you, you gotta give respect for like business moves and, and and you know, just because it's not your cup of tea doesn't mean that like they're not doing something right, right? Like Yeah, for sure. Speaking of tea, did you know that Yogi Tea is run by a cult? <laughs> I did not know that. But yeah. It doesn't surprise me. Turns out like all these major tea places are run by cults. Um I believe it's Sleepy Time Tea is like ran by the cult for unification and purification. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. I, I went to high school with someone that started like a pretty successful tea company. Um, oh, what are they called? Is it? it did he start a cult too? No, <laughs> no, I don't think so. He's a pretty normal guy. Uh, the, the CEO of Tenzo Tea is uh, is someone I went to high school with. Super random fact of the day. <laughs> That's cool, man. Are you a big tea drinker or a, or coffee drink, drinker? Don't drink coffee. Don't drink alcohol. Don't drink tea. Like, drink water, soda, juice. That's about it. Hey, water for the win, man. I, I don't know how many cups of or ounces of water I drink every day. Just I, sw- I got a, what's it called? They're the really famous water bottles. Oh, the, uh, Jesus Christ. Hydro flask. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I got a a 24 ounce hydro flask that I've had for, I got it for not Blue Ridge. I got it for a furnace fest 2022. Yeah. And, uh, I've been using it since then. I drink like four of those a day. Cool. Cool. Crazy. Crazy. The water's good for you, right? The water's good. Then I got to get my caffeine intake. (laughs) brilliant okay so this comes into my next question what do you do when you're not doing music uh racing racing is pretty much my life and the fact of like i'm a sports agent um and manage nascar drivers so i do like the sponsorship the marketing um that's what i do probably with 80 percent of my time um you know, I work super long weeks. I travel pretty much every weekend for work, and um, I'm, the, I'm at the off season right now, so enjoying it while it lasts. But of um, you know, really building a business has really been like the 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 subtle part of um, music from the outside, under the fact of you know being able to continue playing music and not have it like be like my soul. Uh, breadwinner essentially you know trying to win money or trying to you know financially float myself off music like music should never be about money obviously at the same time musicians are taking advantage of way too much but um you know one of the reasons why like you know i was so passionate about the agent stuff and, and going out and and you know building a business um was so that i could continue to play music and not have to worry about the bills being paid you know so um it becomes a lot more fun when that's the case for sure. Of course. And I mean, I'm just going off of your Wikipedia here. Cause you, you, oh, got Jesus a, Christ. you got a cool Wikipedia. I haven't read it in a while. I, would uh, someone sent it to me like a year ago, but I haven't read it since then. Under genres, it says experimental. Yeah. That's kind of what everybody labeled, uh, ism Foff as. Would you uh would you continue to label your music as experimental or more uh nah, more not pop-based? really like like I, I was I, I was never that was like much more like Matt's side of it and like Matt's branding and you know Matt was never like Matt one of the things that makes Matt such a good musician is like he's not afraid to like step outside the box even if it's like too far outside the box, you know, like he's not afraid of being his own person, his own band, his own genre, um, which I think is super cool. Um, but, uh, you know, my brain doesn't work quite that way. I wish it did, to be honest with you in different scenarios, but, um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, consider the new stuff experimental at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I think they need to update it because all they got is, experimental occupations musician instruments guitar 
crazy. Yeah, they, they need to up, yeah. update this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Of course, it's got under other projects your your NASCAR management. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, you got Joe Graff Jr. I, yep, still got Joe, still got Chris Hacker. Um, uh, got a few more. Yeah, and it says uh, Logan. Logan Miseraka. Yeah. So I don't have Logan anymore. We're still super, super good friends. But like she, she took off on on uh, like Instagram and, and TikTok, and like she's got a huge, huge, super, super media, uh, social media following. Uh, shout out Logan. Logan's cool as fuck. She's, um, you know, I think that she's gonna be a staple in the sport to come. And although like we're not working together anymore, we're still mm-hmm. super close friends, and you know, definitely want to see her succeed for sure. Yeah, of course. Um. When it comes to NASCAR, um, what who do you think is the uh, the standout person for the coming year? Oh man, I guess in the Cup Series. Um, hmm. And are you going to be here for the Coca Cola Five Hundred? Six Hundred. Yes, I will be or, there. Or six hundred. Uh, <laughs> no, all good. All good. All good. Um, Sorry, that made me sound like a giant douchebag. I'm no, sorry. No, you're good. Uh, I get them confused uh, all the time. I'm yeah, no, no, is what for I sure. forget all the time. Um, I will. Yeah, I'll be there for the, for the Coke 600 for sure. I would say, um, Cup Series. Uh, I think that. Um, I mean, William Byron did an incredible job this year, and I think that they're they're trending in the right direction. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Um. Yeah, I'm gonna go with William Byron. To be honest with you, that that's gonna be my guy in the Cup Series, Xfinity Series. Um, I think Sheldon Creed or uh, Chandler Smith are both gonna win a bunch of races, and that'll be cool to see for sure. Um, they're both good dudes. Um, but uh, yeah, re- like uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be a crazy race season, but I'm hoping that's gonna be my most successful, but um least stressful uh race season as an agent so far that's that's the hope so um especially with some of the stuff that's going on with losers club and whatnot i'm hoping that uh you know music stays a focus but uh you know still still able to have the same passion about the job and whatnot for sure of course well when you come down here for the coca-cola 600 there's a great italian spot over in uh monroe called napoli i'm in let's do okay, it let's do it man because it let's is it, it's run by, I think it's run by an Italian family. I'm not quite sure, but it is. My wife and there went there after my grandparents and my aunt and my whole family raved about it. Like, it's great Italian spot. It's like, uh, what? there's one called Sal's in Virginia that's really popular. They're like, it's just as good as Sal's, you know. You got to go there. I went there. Fantastic. So Yeah, for yeah, sure. We'll do it, man. I'm in. I'm in all day. So, we're getting toward the end here. I got a couple more questions. My favorite uh, question will come up shortly. But, uh, new music. You got, I mean, I know you just released uh, Dropout. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have another new single out here shortly. Probably in the next couple months. Um, but, yeah. Definitely. Uh, uh, Dropout is definitely like the main focus of, of getting the streams up on that and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the, the stuff that we're going to put out for sure. Of course. And then new shows. Do you have any, uh, new shows for the new year? Not right now. Um, there's some stuff going on behind the scenes, like good stuff. Um, but I think that that's going to change pretty quickly. I'm sure that we'll have some shows to announce here shortly for sure. Sounds good. Okay. Now on to my, my last two favorite parts. We got gear talk, great talk and dream festival. Okay, so first one was Gear Talk. Yep, got to ask you about your gear. So I've never really been a big gear guy. Um, Like, even, like, when it comes to, like, recording and producing and whatnot, like, we've always gotten by on, like, the bare minimum. Like, the the, the, the dropout, like, that we just did, like, we did it on, like, a, 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 we did it on a ripped version of Logic with some... (laughs) some VSTs that we bought, but for the most part, like line six pod farm was like what we use for most of the guitars. Um, you know, like 
basic like flex tune is what we use for like editing a lot of like the vocals and stuff and um a lot of it just seemed like it came down to like knowing how to use it per se um you know i wasn't one of those people that's like oh i need to use this piece of hardware with that piece of hardware or anything like that like you know whatever guitar was in the room that was going to stay in tune at the time was pretty much like what we used or, or whatnot um you know um we like i as far as like guitars go like i definitely have like a variety um you know when it came to losers club like like i said like they're I don't feel like there was one like go to guitar that I used on everything, like different parts. I would, I would record different things, but, um, you know, like definitely like a big fan of Telecasters. Um, I've always been a big fan of Telecasters, which s- kind of sucked with, uh, with, with some of the heavier stuff because like, you know, they're not really a guitar that's made for heavier stuff, but, um, you know, Hector had a, telecaster that i used for a long time that was set up for for heavier for heavier music which was awesome but um you know i had an endorsement deal with esp ltd for a long time um and like they always took care of me um they uh or sorry esp um they always took care of me which was cool and like i definitely was like the go-to guitar for a long time was the ec 1000 um I have had a few of them. I still use one of them for recording. Um, you know, it, it, like as far as like heavier stuff goes, like I guess that's my go-to guitar for for heavy shit all the time. Um, but um, you know, as far as like like live gear, um, I had to deal with Orange up until like 2017, and then we went everything digital. Um, which everybody like switched to the Kempers and I used the Kemper one tour and I didn't really like it that much. So I switched to the line six, um, the line six helix, um, which like, I think a lot of people like are scared of it because like it's line six, but like, honestly, the helix is unbelievable. Um, I, I feel like I could tell day and night between that and the Kemper. Um, I still swear by that thing. You know, it's, it's a, it's a great amp and, and great processor. So, um, yeah, I mean that for the most part that that's what I that's what I use in in, in that regard. Um we still played through orange cabs. We still do that. Um like, you know, I, I feel like the one thing I haven't really adapted with, and it's something I probably have to adapt with over time, but I'm not a big in ears guy. Um never really liked using in ears. Um always kind of liked the raw sound. Um, so like essentially what we would do is we'd use the cabs just for stage volume. Um, but we would send the helixes direct to the house. Um, so that like the mics weren't, or the, the cabs weren't mic'd or anything. It was just all for stage volume, but it just felt like it gave it like a more like organic feel that, you know, that we could feel whatnot. You know, we did international tours where we used in-ears and just ran DI with no cabs and whatnot. It just never just never felt right like i just felt like i just didn't have the same energy like it wasn't as like fulfilling i guess you know like you couldn't feel the music as much so um yeah i i guess as far as gear talk that 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 covers probably most of that but um what was what was the next one on the list uh so we're gonna do this thing called dream festival okay um i'll walk you through it it's it's gonna be a lot of fun i promise so i mean the idea is you are going to be playing this festival. That's the only rule. So, you know, Losers Club is going to play the festival. But this is all going to be a, a festival of your own design. Okay. And I'll, so, I'll, yeah, I'll walk you through it. So, uh, I'm trying to think of artists that I would want to yeah. play a festival with. Um, Headliners would probably be, I'm thinking of like OG bands I grew up on. Yeah. I, it's going to laugh, but just for the sake of like seven year old Nate, like three doors down for sure. Okay. Um, I dig it. Uh, Dan and Shay for sure. Um, 
trying to think of who else. Uh, who else did I grow up listening to that like little Nate would be stoked on? Uh, Guar for sure. Yes. <laughs> like Guar was so sick. Uh, I'd say Three Days Grace. Um, okay. And. I'll give you one more on the headline side. Um, I was a huge yellow card guy. I I, I loved yellow card. Um, Big Oceans Avenue type. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like some 41, simple plan. Uh, You know, all those types of bands. As far as like smaller bands, um, the Dangerous Summer was probably like my favorite band as like a like a scene kid i guess per se like in in the scene uh vanna was always a huge vanna fan carnifex uh trying to think of who else um point north i gotta give a shout out to uh city lights would love to see city lights do a reunion uh those guys are in bear tooth now but um was a huge city lights guy um oh man i'm trying to think of as it is i really liked as it is they broke up recently i think i'm not sure if i'm supposed to say that but yeah they're uh (laughs) big as it is fan um let me look at my let me look at my apple music Um, let me see if they uh um Yeah, they've they've been inactive since twenty twenty two. Yeah. So you're Andrew you're good to McMahon, say. <laughs> Andrew McMahon in the wilderness for sure. Um The Band Camino. I love the band Camino. Uh I'll give you like three more. Cute is what we aim for. Okay. Um uh, Family Force Five for sure. Oh, that's a it, that's a deep cut right there. Yeah, they were sick. I I miss I miss them. I'll go with nothing nowhere. Okay. I'm gonna add a couple rappers. I'll put an L N L E Choppa. Okay. Uh I'll put an Uzi. Okay. Put in the used. And I will put in last one. I will put in uh I'll put an NBA young boy. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. But yeah. I, that lot lot of random names on there, but overall probably what I'd do. <laughs> You got a great lineup. It's almost like a what's that one festival that's got the varied artists? Almost kind of like Lollapalooza, to be honest. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, they've had what Lorna Shore there. Yeah, they've and, they've been they've been definitely expanding, which is which is which is cool. Like they've definitely been having some 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 artists from like this genre, which is cool. So, for sure. Your festival's cooler though. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So, uh, where's it gonna be? Where's it gonna be? Um, Red Rocks Amphitheater in Denver. That's a great one. Such a beautiful venue. I, I love. I love that place. I've, I've been a few times. Never played it, but loved the uh, love. Loved it there for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, festival at Red Rocks Amphitheater. Um, what's the catering going to be like? Cause you gotta have food. Dude, you know, what's crazy is like, <laughs> I feel like people don't really talk about this, but like festival catering is always a fucking mess for like smaller bands. Like, I don't think I've played a festival in like the last, besides Aura Fest, shout out Aura Fest. But like, I don't think I've played a festival that. has successfully had food for everybody that's needed it in like six years. 
like Jeez. besides Orin Fest. Like, um, I feel like it's always awkward because like, you know, when you're a smaller band or like you're not one of the headliners or whatnot, like you kind of don't want to step on toes. So you don't really know when the appropriate time is to like go in and get it and whatnot. Um, so it, it, I feel like it's never talked about, but like, that's definitely a thing like where like festivals just never order enough food ever. But I would say bands hate it. I love it. It's kind of a contradiction, but Mexican food, definitely, uh, like burritos, tacos, definitely big, big Mexican guy for sure. Don't, don't go on a, don't go play a show the next day. <laughs> I mean, gotta have a stomach worth of steel, right? Yeah, that's right, man. Well, hey, you know, Mexican food is a generally loved type of food, so. For you know, sure, it's great, definitely, great definitely, uh, definitely a, a communal favorite for sure. Okay. So what is your accommodations going to be like? Are you going to camp? Are you getting a, a Airbnb, a hotel? What's it looking like? Um, You know, I was never this guy when I was younger. Like, I was always like, hey, take a van, take a van, take a van. Let's make more money, whatnot. You know, as I got older, I definitely got, like, more into, like, you know, the bus was more appealing for sure. Like, there was a lot of tours that we could have afforded a bus that we just didn't take one out on because like, you know, we'd rather be able to like pay people better or, or you know, be able to bring more money home. Um, as I got older, like that definitely shifted a little bit. Like having a bus, especially at a festival, if it's outside and whatnot, like it's definitely like so good to have somewhere where you can go back and hang like – and like is yours and is your territory and you can relax and you know get out of the heat and whatnot like i will say like when we did aura fest uh when we did aura fest we did uh we had a hotel that was literally right next to the festival um and that was really really nice from the fact of like you know like when i say right next to the festival i mean like in like like it shared a parking lot essentially so That's cool. um that was really nice in the sense of like, you know, everybody could be showered up and ready to go and cool and, you know, hanging back. So I would say, I don't know if there's a hotel at Red Rocks, but I would definitely probably do a hotel if there was a Red Rock, if there's one right there. Um, you know, just having a place to go back and relax and like kind of just have your peace before you play is definitely, definitely nice for sure. Okay. Well, you know, this is your dream festival. So even if there isn't, there is now. All right, cool, cool. Okay, I I like your festival, man. It's uh, it's nice. It's at a nice venue. You know, you got a hotel that magically appeared across the street. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Um, now this is the hardest question of them all when it comes to the Dream Festival. What would you call it? Oh man, what would I call it? I know it's this this question stumps everybody and it, it's it's a more recently new question I added to the dream festival. Oh man, I don't even know. Uh Jesus. I <laughs> um man I, I know, man. It spitball one off the top of your head. It, it doesn't oh, have man, to be I'm, good. You got I'm, this. I'd probably make it like some sort of MySpace reference. Okay. Like, oh man. There's so many ways you can go with that. Yeah, like. Uh, Probably make it MySpace themed in some in some way. Um, I miss like the MySpace, dude. I I wish MySpace had had, had survived. It would have was such an awesome tool for bands. Um, is that still? Is it still even up anymore? No. It's, well, kind of. Like they they sold the name, but like, um, 
Oh man. Um It's now a music website. Yeah. Huh. All right, just women uh, I'm winning. Uh on a whim, um Man, I, I don't. This is gonna sound lame because I had nothing to do with this name and like I had nothing to do with this EP. So like, I feel bad saying it. So shout out Matt and shout out Lotus. But um, it's the only name I can think of right now, and it's one hundred percent stealing it from somebody else, which is, <laughs> is fucked. So uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'd be here if I. We'd be here forever if I didn't say it. But uh, I'd probably call it the online now fest. I like it, man. Hey. You know what? If it was good enough for them, it's good enough for your festival. Well, like I said, shout out Matt, shout out Lotus, like that one hundred percent credit to them. So I dig it, man. Well, that's that's your festival. One hundred percent. It's only you know it. It doesn't seem like it costs too much either. So you got a cool. good mix. For sure. Um, and I think that, I think that's all my questions. Uh, I got, I got one more question for you. What goes great with chocolate besides peanut butter? What goes great with chocolate? I'm not a big chocolate guy. Uh, I mean, strawberries. Like there you go. It's about it that I can think of. Um, you know, I used to be more of a big chocolate guy. Um, I mean, I'll still eat it, but yeah, I'm not a chocolate guy at all. I I crave the more salty things than the sweet things nowadays. For sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. It, I I had a great time, man. It was it was a lot of fun. Dude, me too. You had a lot of unique questions, and and I think that that's awesome. You know, like you you dove into your knowledge, and and that's awesome. So, um, definitely appreciate it, man. And hope that, like I said, next time that I'm down in Charlotte, we'll definitely uh, go grab some Italian food. For sure. Sounds good. Uh, what do you want to have for your out uh, the outro song of the uh, podcast? Something you wrote. Uh, have it be, uh, oops, high school reunion. Okay, we'll make it happen. Then. Thank awesome. you so much, man. Appreciate it, man. We'll talk soon. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. together again but honestly this shit just feels like there's a gun in my head it's not me here what i thought this shit would end up like this i hope you're all miserable cause you deserve nothing less some days i feel like a fraud cause you still pulls it up but my dad and my mom just put away my love and got a job and he is the one that's on the ass for